Now the topic of this talk is about ornaments in modern and postmodern architecture in Malaysia. First of all, before commencing on the talk, let's ask the question, why is this talk on ornament important? Well, on the surface, once upon a time in traditional architecture in Malaysia, we had ornaments that we call carvings and also other manner in which buildings are so-called decorated. Suddenly, with the introduction of modern architecture, these carvings and ornaments disappeared. Then, these carvings and ornaments reappeared in postmodern architecture in terms of revivalism where it appears in hotels as well as administration building now the question of ornament is very interesting because it's not just about ornament in architecture but it is also about the philosophy of life as we know it Now, when we look at the traditional wood carvings of the Malay architecture, it was once part of the general way in which buildings are presented, whether it is for a lay person or a bangsawan or the royalty. Suddenly, carvings and ornaments in the 20th century Malaysia were restricted only to elitist architecture, such as hotels, resorts, palaces, and grand mosques. Is there a role for ornament in architecture? Is it important? Why should we involve a discourse in ornament? These are the questions that need to be asked. Now, the main message of this talk is about how ornaments in contemporary Malaysian architecture was stopped or it had disappeared. The reason being because there is no discourse on ornament and modern architecture that was developed. If we were to look at the uh, writings in Putubahan Architect Malaysia flagship magazine Majalah Architect, there does not seem to be any discussion whatsoever on ornament or the idea of carvings except for its description and in relation to traditional architecture and as well as uh, conservation efforts. Now the West, however, had developed a discourse on ornament which is very interesting and very deep and also very meaningful. Whereas in Malaysia, this discourse did not happen. As I have said, a lot of times, Malaysia and other third world country, they merely wait for the discourse to happen in the West and then they would adapt it. Even if they discuss it or not, sometimes it would just be put on buildings in this way or that way. In order to uh, be more meaningful, we need uh, to develop the discourse on ornament and architecture so that it can once again help in aspects of communication and identity. Now I will present a brief overview of the discourse on ornament and architecture in the traditional past of Europe into the modern and postmodern periods. Then I will look at the uh, brief uh, overview of the approaches on the, in the search of Malaysian architecture and identify where ornament fits or do not fit in this approaches. 
I would finally then suggest how this discourse on ornament uh, can once again flower in this country. The periods which I will briefly discuss as an introduction is the ancient world, Greek and Roman architecture, how ornament played in that society. Then in the European Gothic and Renaissance or the Christian period of Europe. Then the age of enlightenment in which Christianity itself is being questioned by philosophers which gave birth to the early thoughts of modern architecture of Eugene, Morris, Ruskin and the maturity of this whole aspect in the international style and then going on to the modern architecture period of the 20th century and finally the rise of postmodern architecture to redefine the idea of Now, starting with the ancient world, the Greek and Roman architecture, it is similar to any of the architecture, whether we are talking about Malaysia, Malay architecture or whether we are talking about Chinese architecture. Carvings and ornaments that we discuss, describe as ornament, plays a very important role in that society. First of all, what is the term ornament? Ornament is actually a term used by historian or scholars to describe an element of architecture that has nothing to do with the structure or construction aspect of the building. It is something additional. Without ornament, the building can still stand. Without ornament, people can live in the building in terms of its ventilation. Thus, any aspect of well, in one sense, beautification, but more so uh, to give a certain message and meaning to the building that has no constructional or structural function is deemed as ornament. Now, the term itself is misleading because it seems to relate directly to the idea of beautification, which in fact, in many buildings, it is not. It is part and parcel of the building. For instance, a mosque having the, 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 the carvings of Allah and Muhammad. It is to honor the building, to remind the Muslims about God and the Prophet. So in that sense, it has some kind of communicative function and not simply a beautification process. So we need to understand that ornament is not just about beautification. It's also about part of the meaning in society relating to rituals, values, symbols, and the craftsman being part of the society understand all this because they are also part of it. During the Christian era, the Gothic churches and the Renaissance churches were filled with what we term as carvings, sculptures, or the term ornament, which is actually not a very good term to be used, because as I have said in previous lectures, the churches or the interior of the churches are more like the pages of a book. Buildings were specifically designed in order for uh, sculptures, ornaments, frescoes to be placed in them so that it performs a communication function and also the function of not just literary but also the idea of being in a space uh, that is godly, that is divine, that has a certain power of spirituality and this is the expression that is given for the inside of the building. Now for the outside, it has certain formal language and 
we could call it decoration uh, because aspects of communication in terms of uh, the uh, more in depth meaning of the building is not necessarily more important. It is inside the building that is more important. And so these ornaments and architecture exist side by side, needing each other. Now in the uh, late um, 18th and 19th centuries, uh, the, the questions of, of ornament uh, became a moral question, especially with people like uh, Violet, uh, with uh, Augustus Pugin. Pugin, it is stated by historians, uh, was a religious and devout Christian. And he believed that the true Christian architecture exists in the Gothic architecture, which in some sense is not really considered to be a very beautiful or a very important, in one sense, uh, architecture. Um, because of its roughness, in a sense, or the idea that uh, it's not that refined. But Eugene believed that it is truthful. Even though it is robust, it is truthful, it is, um, it is sincere. And so he supported the medieval Gothic architecture, and he supported it over such things like the Renaissance because he began to equate certain moral uh, functions of ornament in which ornament should perform some sort of constructional and structural function aside from its communicative idea. Nothing must be included which was not for convenience, construction or propriety. That was his moral principle. The building must honestly express its function and material. And so, a gargoyle sitting on a flying buttress is very important because it's performing a structural function. And an ornament should consist of the essential of the building construction. In one sense, the structure must be expressed and not covered up with arbitrary or superfluous decoration. For the first time, we see a principle in which ornament must play some kind of function that is related to structure of the building or construction of the building. With this discourse on ornament, it led to the thoughts of modern architecture very early on in the 19th, late 19th century and early 20th century. First of all, we have people like Violet Ledoux who began to question why ornaments were, were built or were crafted out of stone or marble, like in the classical age or stucco. But in order to give it its truthful nature, he had suggested that the material such as iron which can perform both a structural and an ornamental function. And here we can see in the staircase of the uh, Tessel house, uh, the marriage between ornament, structure and construction within the principle set out by Pugin, but phrased within a iron construct. And so this is one of the discourse in which ornament must play a structural function. I think in the traditional Malay architecture uh, or in other uh, tribal or ethnic groups, we have the rattan or the, the rotan or rattan in which we have uh, the idea of weaving it into some sort of ornament, but it strengthens the structure of the chair or the table.
Gaudi experimented with reinforced concrete to marry the idea of meaning into the structure. And it is a building that is laden with some sort of metaphorical or mythical meaning um, that seems like a, in a dream or a dreamlike state. But he is expressing concrete into more than just a structural material. Vedic Ledoux mentions that if a Gothic architect were to be alive in the 19th or 20th century and has iron as his tool, he would not be constructing buildings or even uh, any craft or ornament uh, that is in the same way that he would be doing it in the 12th century because that is to falsify the first law of art which is to conform to the needs and customs of the time. Again, a moral principle, a principle which says it has to be something with the spirit of the time. And so we can see in his uh, designs of the uh, cantilevered bracket or bridges, the webbing of the trusses is part and parcel also of a kind of an ornament. So it is a marriage again between structure, construction, beauty and ornament. The other discourse was set up by Sullivan who looked at ornament not as a structural piece as Eugene or Violet Ledoux had done, but more of a political identity in which he claimed that copying uh, ornaments, whether they are of stucco or carved from stone or from uh, iron, uh, if the motifs were to be following the classical architecture of Greek and Roman, then that is a false notion. So he developed a new system of ornament based on the motif of landscapes, flowers and plants from the United States. As he also uh, created the placement of ornament in a very beautiful and strategic manner that scholars have said had extended the classical tradition rather than copying the classical tradition. And so in the uh, National Farmers Bank, we can see a beautiful rendition of a new placement of ornament by also using new kinds of ornament that Sullivan had created within the spirit of the place. Whereas when we look at Bill Ledoux, he was talking about spirit of time, but in Sullivan, it's both spirit of place and spirit of time. We see how Sullivan using iron to create new ornament system that is not copied from any of the Greek or Roman heritage that was popular at the time. He called this the New American He said, it is well that we should know the Roman temple was in fact as nearly as we through archaeological inquiry can arrive at. But the deepest reach of our scholarship will reveal only this, that the Roman temple was a part of Roman life, not of American life, that it beat with the Roman pulse, was in touch with Roman activities, that is waned with Roman glory, it died a Roman death. And thus, Roman does not mean American, never did mean American, never can mean American. Roman was Roman, American is and to be American. So another moral principle that was set up by 
Sullivan is to honor the political, social, technological spirit of the time and of each place, not to revive someone else's heritage. That would be a falsity or, or to a falsification of art in its truest form. Art in its truest and fantastic form is the expression of the spirit of the time, spirit of the place, and spirit of the people and the inspiration of the collective nature of society of that particular place. Ruskin had said that the architect is carefully guarded from the common troubles of the common man, building for ignorant, purse-proud, digesting machines. Living art must have more in it than imitated style. Ruskin had already cri uh, criticized revivalism, where the race among architects was to imitate the past styles of Rome, Greece, Italy. And thus, he alludes to the idea that art must take care of the concerns of the common man. By imitating the styles of old, you are not directly looking at the problem of the common man in a certain particular place. So a kind of a social critique of art and architecture. Morris also mentioning the critique against industrialization and to brighten, to strengthen, to refine or to reform a single living spirit never enters into our estimate of advantages. Here, Morris is taking the line uh, that too much technology and too much capitalism uh, that created the factory will not give dignity to the existence of the community and to the individual. Therefore, the art and architecture that comes out of it will not be true, will not last very long. We see also now that cities, towns, and uh, places can be bankrupt if the factory relocates. And that is the warning that Morris had said, we are all subservient to a capitalist system that honors the machine and does not honor people, human beings. Right, learn from Sullivan and created his own system of ornament for his building. And this is incredible because Wright is known as a man who understands structure, who understands construction, who understands industrialization, and is an art, an art and craft proponent, proponent or supporter like Morris or Ruskin but he does not mind the machine. He does not mind the factory, but he says you must master the machine. Let not the machine master you, meaning you would just use whatever the machine or the factory produce, and that is wrong. You must give the machine work. You are the creative force. Uh, criticism of Morris and others on the machine is that it is not creative, it is repetitive. It is imitative. But Wright said that you can be creative and still use the machine. You make the machine uh, produce the creative things that you have done. So ornament is individually, strictly democratic, but it must be mass produced by the machine. Uh, even though you have the idea of organic architecture, that is unique, but it can be by the machine. Thus, in his uh, production of architecture, Wright created the idea of decorating the building within the space 
uh, and construction and material as well as the structure uh, of the building. The ornament was never uh, to be something else, but it must be within the whole form. For instance, the lighting and the casement for the lighting, which he created himself. And the moldings, which are all in terms of lines that reminds us of cubism. And there is a theory Wright was the one who initiated the idea of cubism and not people like Mondrian or Wrightville. Um, we can see in this design of the chair which Wright had created as well as the sculpture and the stained glass window. Wright had used geometry to uh, establish an abstraction for the plant motif that we can see in the stained glass window as well as to, at the chair. And we see the humanized idea within a cubist framework. And that was the philosophy of uh, Wright marrying the idea of the place that brings in the plants, that brings in the legend. Uh, so a place has things like landscape elements like plants that can become motive. It also has legends that can become a sculpture. And this is the thing that gives the building its life meaning. We can see in the uh, Unity Temple, the epitome of Wright's creation of the marriage between form of the building and the so-called ornament with the lighting fixture and the uh, moldings that has been placed on the ceiling resembling cubist architecture. Now, in other buildings like Falling Water or Taliesin West, Wright for, had not really made the ornament uh, clear, but he is suggesting by the different use of natural material, we can see the decoration already. But it is a natural decoration, part and parcel of the construction and the structure. We can never call this ornament but it gives the contrast, the beauty that we can see in nature. The contrast between the stone and the reinforced concrete uh, in the uh, falling water. The contrast between timber and rough stone uh, that was uh, taken on site. And, 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 and give the idea of beauty with a different texture of expression. But we cannot call it ornament, but the spirit can be called ornamental, even though it fulfills the function of construction and structure 100%. Now, when Germany embarked on the mass production of material and became an economic powerhouse in the world, it had already uh, created the Wokbund which is an institute that combined the engineers and architects with that of artisan and craftsmen to combine them to produce beautiful and workable and functional uh, designs for uh, household items like lamps, pots and pans, furniture, and also in architecture. And so the idea of ornament disappeared in one sense, but it actually appear in the we can see in the uh, steel mal uh, in the in the glass mullion uh, in the expression of the steel. But we cannot call this ornament because they are all functional, all construction. This is the idea that uh, anything that does. Uh, 
away with the idea of wastage of material, wastage of uh, manufacturing uh, is considered immoral. Adolf Luz made the argument that some people who have tattoos on their body are making some sort of a falsification of their life. He said that if a tribe uh, who are the Papuans have tattoos, well, it's because uh, they have some meaning uh, to put into their body as well as also certain meaning that they put onto their boats. But they are Papuans, they are primitive, and they believe in primitive things. But why is it that people put tattoos in the modern age when they are not Papuans? And therefore, this shows a degeneration of thought. And that is how he argues that uh, ornament to be put on modern building, such as train stations, office building which are new forms are all falsification and therefore any sort of ornament any short sort of addition to the building that has no functional requirement of structure construction and utility is considered false and immoral and with that he struck a blow on all ornaments Herman Muthesius went around the world trying to find the best solution for industrialization. Industrialization to Herman Muthesius is not just about making a lot of things in a standard manner, but it must have beauty and also utility. And that was why he loved the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, People like Gropius were rationalizing the idea of, of housing, houses in which um, the new lifestyle with a new kind of work pattern, recreation, uh, socializing becomes different. And the manner in which this occurs with things like cars, trains, aeroplanes are no longer the same and thus it needs a new kind of architecture, a rational architecture, an architecture of reason, not sentiment or tradition. Kabuzue made the, the idea in this manner. He said if you're going to create an aeroplane, you cannot just think of a beautiful shape and create the aeroplane. The aeroplane answers specific mathematical requirement of aerodynamic uh, forces. And so every inch of the aeroplane must be designed so that it can lift loads in the best and the least economic fashion. And that becomes the form. Form is a product purely of function. If you can if you can think of the function, the economics of construction, then you will have the right form. Form is not something that comes romantically from some sort of imagination of the past. Uh, for instance, the house now. The house is always designed in relation to tradition. How we live in the past is how we created the house. He said this can no longer be. We have to, we have to rationalize the house deconstruct the idea of living. What is living in the 20th century? What is living in the new modern lifestyle of work pattern and recreation? What is the best way of living uh, to have uh, a nice environment with the sun, with the forest, with the trees, and with urbanization? What is, what is the best way? And that needs to be rationalized. And after rationalization occurs, then the form will be. This is what happened when he designed such houses as the Villa Savoie. The whole house doesn't look like a house or the traditional image of the house. Why? Because Kabuzi was designing it 
from the spaces meaning uh, uh, a house is simply a place in which it and it it captures the experience of the person the ex the person comes into space uh, that opens up and then uh, private space is closes around garden space opens it up to the world and so um, architecture is simply an envelope to the experience but before this architecture is supposed to be an object an object that you would revive an object that you would imitate an object that you would adapt but here he discarded all of them and merely said that it is based on what your eyes and what your 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 um, state of feeling with respect to light uh, as well as the sight of nature and things like being able to breathe and the idea of being in a in a space and so uh, the building becomes a backdrop and turns this way or that way according to the uh, to the feeling or the needs of the soul the soul wanting to be at peace wanting to be happy and therefore happiness and the feeling of calmness is about the experience of seeing and that seeing uh, of nature from the house creates the idea of huge or long ribbon windows and glass walls and that is the thing that by the time modern architecture became what was known as international style in one sense there is no more ornament but in another sense i suspect the structure now becomes ornament okay before this i said that ornament is something that has nothing to do with structure but then later on we remember uh, ornament was supposed to be part of structure in the art nouveau here the choice of uh, expressing buildings are now limited because you cannot have ornament to beautify and so architects begin to look at structure how to make structure become so iconic noticeable but at the same time understanding the the forces of economy and structure for instance the dulles international airport certainly is a beautiful building and we can see the pylons very clearly the glass there is no applied ornament there it's very rough but it is beautiful why because it has this clarity now is this building more expensive or less expensive than a normal building with columns inside i think this building is more expensive and so the idea of economy is not there but it is more for the showing off of structure and that becomes what i term as a kind of the new ornament because uh, if you look at the twa terminal uh, if you were to build a conventional building, it will probably cost 10 times less. But because of the use of shell construction, of which the structure is expressed almost like a bird trying to take flight, that becomes uh, what I term as a kind of ornament, but not the kind that you apply to a wall or to a column. The whole thing, the whole structure is it the closest i could say is something to do with art nouveau but the modern architect or modernist will never admit to it they will just say that well the form came up simply because of the need of the construction and the economies of structure as well as the utilitarian purposes of the building that is all nothing else intended Now, when Hitler came to power with such people as Mussolini, they began to see a different kind of world order. They began to see that uh, society must be governed by the iron hand. And so they began to look at the grandeur of Rome, the grandeur of past empires, 
And so they criticized modern architecture for having a lack of vision in terms of this um, idea of empire. And thus, monumentalism and the idea of uh, creating building to express the power is no longer there. And so they embark on their own sense of architecture by not copying the Romans and Greek, but adapting and taking in certain uh, what we call abstraction of void and space and solid and making the building having a very strong evocative meaning, not with ornament, but with the, the choice of structure. Certainly in a modern uh, construction of steel and, and concrete, we can build buildings without columns, but here columns are purposely being chosen of a size that is uh, evocative of certain emotion. And, and so this becomes a meaning. As I said, when ornament disappeared with modern architecture, architects began to find meaning through structure. Here, the architects begin to find meaning in adapting forms, not adapting ornament. So meaning comes from the form, history, material, uh, texture, that becomes uh, the idea of imparting meaning in architecture. In this modern architecture treats, in a way, architecture like engineering because they use the metaphor for aeroplane, for bridges. And so they, they imbue it with the idea of only utilitarian. And therefore, the form that comes up is the form and beauty actually should not really be part of it. It is the answer to a stated problem. But people like Wright and Corbusier want to have meaning in this architecture because if not, they said there would not be meaning. And how did they express it? Wright still use ornament, but the ornament that is mass producible and integrated with structure. Corbusier later on developed his baton brood and his uh, idea of um, of uh, very rough architecture uh, and lighting that uh, gives meaning. Here also is a similar uh, approach by the architects of Mussolini and also of uh, Hitler. Other criticisms of modern architecture are by regionalists like Hassan Fatih, who says that if we were to revive the traditional construction, we would save a lot of money because the traditional society cannot afford prefabricated concrete, uh, steel uh, factories, and, and, and um, with the abundance of materials such as adobe, why should one use concrete? And the abundance of labor such as the craftsman, why should one rely on Western uh, technology? And so he projects meaning uh, through the idea of reviving traditional architecture, not European architecture, like the revivalism of Greek and Roman in America, uh, which was something that Sullivan was against. Now, then we have people uh, like Michael Graves in his early period trying to find some kind of meaning in modern architecture. Um, as I said, modern architecture started out with the elimination of ornament so that it becomes an engineering uh, product. And then uh, the uh, architect had to use structure in order to express things. Here, uh, Michael Graves is playing with colors, playing with elements and form. Uh, to say that these are the new uh, meanings. And I am saying that these are the idea of ornament. Uh, the yellow column, the uh, blue balustrade, that is supposed to have some kind of meaning. And uh, this can be construed as a modern way of expression. Although Michael Gray would never say that these are ornaments. 
because as you say everything in a sense has a construction or a structural now when jenks ushered in the the, the idea of postmodern architecture it was to challenge the idea of modern architecture not having meanings jenks argues that a building will take on meaning whether you want it or not people will form meanings from the buildings like he just kasturi created the maybank building people look like it it like a chris he just never wanted it to be to look like a chris he just created a a building uh, which is utilitarian and has some sort of structural expression that was all but people gave it meaning and he did not mind it and so similarly his buildings like tabung haji also was not supposed to have any kind of metaphorical meaning but uh, it was given a meaning and so uh, jeng said that then we can now have to consider people because people have their own memories and meanings of their lives of the place where they were and therefore the the the, the spaces or the places of uh, buildings have their own history and so we need to take that into account but not to do revivalism and so he created the idea of the decorated box in which uh, if you look at the portland building here um, portland building is the municipal building and so he created the building in a sense that uh, it looks like a gateway it's not just not a triumphal arch but it looks and reminds us of the triumphal arch and also classical architecture in which classical architecture is something that belongs to the american uh, heritage so american heritage classical architecture democracy uh, the idea of uh, of the uh, the curtain walls looking like columns and now this is the the, the fact that uh, um the building now is telling a story the building now is like a totem pole of meaning um although the striped curtain walls look like columns they are not columns the building is is, is based on a grid of columns and so the, the 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 morality of modern architecture where structure must be expressed is no longer there the building is now a, a box of meaning and so the columns uh, of curtain wall which look like columns but are not actually columns but function as the communication of the term column same thing like the triumphal arch which is not an arch you, in arch you can go underneath it and through it but here you can't but it looks like an arch and so it gives the impression of a uh, of a gateway of a of a of a triumphal arch gateway in which uh, the municipal building is having now ricardo bofil created this architecture of um, which he called the theater in which it in at the first glance it looks like a huge palace but when in fact it is just an apartment building so when we look at the the idea of the columns and the capitals that line this building they are not columns they are bay windows they are they are columns of glass which certainly is not a structural function but it performs the idea of a series of monumental columns uh, in a row that project the idea of monumentality and thus give the expression of the apartment a kind of a, a royal presence a dignified presence uh, so and all of these uh, elements are prefabricated and can be mass produced in the factory now if we were to look at uh, malaysian architecture uh, we have several kinds of identity the natural manufactured and forced uh, that is presented to us and then we have the uh, approaches by the architects who's trying to define what is best for malaysia uh, machine 
regionalism, primitive regionalism, revivalism, metaphor, modernistic, express, modernistic expressionism, and ornamental eclecticism. Natural identity is about a building expressing its period of time and spirit of place. In the traditional past, as I have explained previously, there was no choice. There are only a limited uh, way to span spaces, build columns and materials and so the building takes on a certain scale, proportion and form. There are no uh, what do you call it uh, waterproofing membrane and so all the roof have cannot be flat roof. It has to be uh, a pitch roof or a pyramidal roof. Um, so we can see the Santiago Calatrava with the uh, ability of steel and uh, reinforced concrete having an expression that cannot be done in any other form of traditional architecture. And therefore, these two buildings present each uh, of their own spirit of time in terms of technology and spirit of place in terms of the expression of the building, although the bridge uh, can be anywhere. Fourth architectural identity is the, is the thing that we see all the time. If you go to Malaysian cities, you see the shop houses, modern shop houses. And also you go to uh, other places, is the housing estate. These are the two forms that has been given to us. No choice. Uh, it is the developer architecture. And so this is what we call false identity. Somebody says that Malaysia has no identity. No, it already has an identity. Like it or not, this is the identity. Now, in the future, we may not like this identity, and so we can eliminate that and rebuild or build new ones. But at the moment, that is the identity. In Putrajaya, uh, somebody created the identity, the identity of Malaysia being dominant by Muslims and also Malay uh, political power. Even though we have Sabah and Sarawak, who is was not mainly Malay, but somebody wants to remind Malaysia is a Malay dominated government, a single ethnocentric uh, idea of a forced political uh, structure. And so the architecture presents uh, an undemocratic idea of uh, single ethnocentric reference. And this is called a manufactured identity. Many disagree with it. That's why. Others fall on the idea of machine regionalism, in which regionalism is the idea of spirit of place, in which place for, uh, plays a very important role, where the climate is being given uh, uh, the importance of uh, determining the form of the building. So the, the machine Niaga has this broken up cylinder that is supposed to cater for the ins and outs of uh, ventilation, and the uh, University of Malaya Lecture Hall having the, 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 the sun shading device within boxes of crates um, and uh, material which is baton brut that can weather any kind of climate. So the building is simply a product of climatic consideration. Uh, we have primitive regionalism in which the focus is on the material. Traditional material have a connection to the past, and have a spiritual connection, because they are created by God in one sense. Uh, it has been there for a long time, and so it has more meaning. Thus, it is appropriate for a house or for a resort in which uh, the idea of reflection, spirituality uh, is being made from the idea of stone and timber. Now, traditional Malay revivalism is simply the blowing up like a balloon of a, of a traditional building or a Malay house into an administrative structure or a, or a institutional structure like a museum, which is the Museum Law Song on the right, uh, making it look like Malay architecture uh, from concrete and as well as creating the uh, walls of Janda Berhias. The, the old Janda Berhias have got timber walls 
um, which is done in that manner for constructional purposes but here it is being imitated by concrete with no function whatsoever Putra World Trade Center also tried to do that with the curtain wall but again as I said uh, in the uh, Portland building the, the idea of postmodern architecture where the column looks like a column but it is not a column has been accepted and so Malaysian uh, architects felt that it was appropriate to adapt it in the use of metaphor as I said some are accidental some are purposeful or intentional like the Puchok Rebung it was um, the intent of Rijas Kasturi to do so because he was looking for the idea of evocative meaning that presents the people or the idea of the of the place uh, which is related to people and so the Puchok Rebung as part of the uh, um, a kind of a food or dish that comes from the plant in a particular place like, like Malaysia uh, becomes his inspiration. The other buildings are accidental metaphors um, and the Sirih Junjung of the Balai Sini Lukis also using a national theatre but again an ethnocentric uh, metaphor that shows against Malay dominance and uh, this may not be appropriate for Malaysia because of its multicultural uh, aspect. Modernistic expression is the combination of structure and the function of uh, sun shading device to form uh, an identifiable building like the parliament house that has a very distinctive characteristic uh, skin um, that forms a kind of a sun shading device but also gives it a very strong character. The deep spaces or the deep uh, overhangs of the Masjid Negara or, or National Mosque again gives the impression of a different kind of uh, uh, a building uh, that is very expressive and, and both the parliament building has if you want to say ornament uh, this would be a very good example of one uh, that has function structure and an evocative form problem is we don't know what is the evocative form supposed to evoke perhaps it's trying to evoke some sort of um, uh, forest or some kind of uh, some people say pineapple and amadillo skin animals and fruits related to the to the landscape i i don't really prefer those kinds of interpretation uh the negris milan moss the use of the uh, conoid and nine uh, minarets again uh, to allude to the uh, negri sambilan the nine states uh, of the culture of the people and so we can see modern architecture trying to project meaning uh, by the use of uh, certain functional elements structure construction sun shading device but placed in a manner that um, uh, that serves its purpose of uh, utility but also evoke another sense of meaning finally we have this uh, eclectic use of ornament which is uh, uh, like the uh, Sunway pyramid this is not a very good example because it is using uh, the heritage of a foreign building uh, for, sorry foreign countries such, such as the uh, Egypt how can you justify to use this kind of thing um, what is next are you going to use Borobudur and, and create a kind of a mall or a discotheque from it, uh, from this building. I mean, there is to be some sort of morality there. And I don't think that the, uh, the idea of creating a shopping complex from uh, heritage of pyramids and springs is, uh, is something justifiable. Similarly, the uh, mosque in uh, Putrajaya, uh, Masjid Putra, it's actually imitating a lot of the uh, Iranian uh, architecture. Although Malaysia 
It's a conservative Sunni uh, country, but uh, certainly the architects don't know the difference and uh, started to look at all sorts of architecture, even including uh, Shia or the Iran. But there is also an element of Indian uh, architecture or mosque architecture there with the smaller domes. An interesting uh, progress was made. Um, if we were to look at uh, Putrajaya, uh, the Propadanan Putrajaya, and also the uh, building on the right, uh, which is the women's ministry. Um, the women's ministry is very evocative because it is said to be by Hijaz Kasturi. And Hijaz had combined the idea of the uh, patterns of clothing uh, with the function of uh, glass mullions and the uh, cladding of the building and weave it in a manner of weaving um, the batik and so creates this kind of uh, functional ornament again. An ornament nonetheless, but an ornament that performs a function and, and, and that is uh, a very interesting approach to take as well as the uh, triumphal arch uh, of the uh, Prabhadaran Putrajaya from metal um, metal shaped uh, angles that gives the evocation of the idea of use of rotan uh, in many of the traditional furniture. Finally, um, how can we evolve this ornament? We need to, to, to look at buildings as more than just a utility space. And um, uh, building performs many other functions of meaning, symbols, rituals. Um, so this needs to be understood first. And elements that help people interpret them are very necessary for the production of good architecture. We also need to intensify, intensify studies on description, placement, and meaning of traditional ornament. This is very weak in Malaysia. What we have are studies, a lot of studies on Malay carvings, but we don't really have studies on its placement. And unfortunately, we also don't have studies of non-Malay carvings and ornament. Uh, because again, of the politics of the country preferring one ethno uh, ethnic group over the others. We should also introduce the idea of uh, creation of ornament at the school or at the uh, university level. In all architectural schools, at the moment there is none. No one is experimenting with the use of ornament because there is no discourse on ornament. Even in interior architecture, although they are known to be producing very beautiful buildings, but they too do not have any sort of discourse on ornament. Now it is fine to use old ornament um, from our past heritage. I don't see that as a problem. I'm not like Adolf Lutz or like others who reject history, tradition, uh, morality, religion. I, I think there is a place for it, but we need to pick and choose, select, and redefine. And better yet that we combine the different uh, cultural heritages to produce a single idea of what Malaysia and Malaysian architecture is all about. We have to discover new motives for new political and religious meanings. Um, not necessarily that we always refer to the past. I've always said something about we could create a motif by using kelapa sawit or oil palm trees because it is an economic powerhouse to the uh, country. And so no one has done any sort of uh, experiment with creating a motif for that and into it to be put into a building. We should also restructure the timber uh, or relief, uh, revive the tradition of timber carvings and also uh, paneling of windows 
so that it becomes one part of the identity of uh, Malaysian architecture. Thus, uh, the idea of ornament is about meaning. It's about identifying and continuing uh, kind of a communication that gives some sort of meaning to, to, to society. That is something that would be define us as a people. And uh, ornament is just like uh, when you eat something, uh, if you are modernist, you would say you just need to eat rice and some meat. But ornament is about the spice of the uh, of food. And this is something which we need to look at, whether you can live without the spice or just live on uh, rice and water. So we need to redefine the role of ornament in modern and postmodern architecture.